Hello, everybody. This is Stu Smith and Jeff Nichols. We are with the Tactical Fitness Report, and this is part two of our police and law, um, firefighter series. Um, we are on the active duty side this time. So we've last uh, podcast, we talked about getting to and through the academy. Uh, now, this is the hard part. Now you're active duty. How do you fit fitness into your crazy schedule and you will say you might have shift work that is uh working nights sometimes you work 24 hours straight 48 hours straight and you sleep at the firehouse if you're lucky um and so anyway we we've had a few uh firefighters really get involved with us um and send a couple of emails i talked to one this morning that comes and works out with us and uh, so let's start off with the, that email, Jeff, and just kind of talk about, I guess, what the firefighters see the problem is and see if we can parallel that with some of the stuff that we've done in the military, as well as with the tactical strength and conditioning program that the NSCA holds. Yep. Things yeah, like so that. I think that's kind of the best, the best approach is that we'll definitely reference what the, the NSCA is doing with their TSAC because I've, I've hosted five uh, here locally and I've done three others and then presented on, and I know Stu has as well at the TSAC. So the big thing is, is we, Stu and I have a reference of what our community has done to overcome some of the issues that are, that, that the firefighters and police are experiencing. And instead of us just saying, Hey, this is what we think we should do. To fix it, we I actually got an email last night from a firefighter, uh, well actually on YouTube, and I'm gonna, I'm going to read through it, and and because it's so well thought out, and I think that this particular firefighter has, is 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 explaining so eloquently exactly what they think should be done, and we agree that this is by doing what he is saying you should do. It, it will resolve many, many of these issues. So without, without any, any more pause here, so as always, information is wonderful. Um, as a firefighter, here are my thoughts. Uh, although many fire academies are starting to get smart about programming during the long days, many are not. This is leading, a bunch of preve this is leading to a bunch of prevent preventable injuries and hence more money being paid out for workman's comp. I, I feel that uh, if others take Others with serious knowledge need to be pushing fire departments to incorporate smart academy programming to training departments. The cost might be a little more upfront to incorporate it. However, this will lead to less injury time and less money spent. Also understanding what is being done as a part of fire training needs to be kept in mind when programming for the PT sessions for the day. What it all boils down to is there are very smart ways of doing things we as a fire service need to break away from tradition and start training smarter. It pays off in the end. And then the second part of the paragraph is really here is the solution to of some of those transition of fire to um, or academy and so on. Uh, as, as far as the training mindset, I, I have always said train as if my life depends on it. My crew's life depends on it. And my victim's life depends on it as well. Having that mindset with type A personality can be, can have, unintended consequences pushing too hard to the point of injury. That is why I prefer to have a coach on scene. I think many firefighters may feel the same way. The CPAT is a great entrance exam. It is pretty difficult, but obtainable. I believe that in order to enter an academy setting, you must, you really should be able to pass it much like the PST. There are some academies that, that make the CPAT a requirement for graduation, not entrance. This should change. The recruit should have passed the CPAT prior to starting the academy. I also wonder, um, he goes on to ask if there's a program and, and so forth. But I, I think that that is, is it, not being a firefighter police officer, but having hosted many of the TSACs and worked with the, the fire and police a lot, this, those two things right there seem to be uh, some of the biggest arguments uh, to, to create some positive change. And then, you know, Stu's going to touch on something that kind of just lumps this all together that highlights the second paragraph about training hard, you know, training smart, doing all those sort of things. Yeah. You know, what I get out of that is um, 
you know, the CPAT for entrance, obviously, like we talked about in the previous uh, podcast, um, all different states and cities have different programming. They may have a different entrance exam. They may have different entrance standards. Uh, some are more challenging than the others. Uh, typically, the ones that you will see that are more challenging are typically uh, the ones that uh, are just more competitive to get to that job. They're, they're, it's a good job. It's, uh, there's a lot of people that want to do that job, so they have a constant flow of recruits that they have to screen, yeah. uh, deselect, so to speak. And then there's some jurisdictions and departments that – um, they don't have a lot of people wanting to do that job. You know, it might not right. have a whole lot of money, uh, to be able, it might not be a great, uh, city to work in, you know, whatever. Um, Some are volunteer even. Yeah. Most. No, yeah, I think yeah. I, I'd heard once that Virginia beach it has the largest volunteer force for EMT in the country. Wow. That's just, I actually heard that from a firefighter in, in, uh, in Hampton, in Newport news. So wow. I'm assuming that, that, that they know what they're talking about. Yes. But it's just, it, it just goes to show the level of commitment that, that this organiz these organizations have. And it, it doesn't make the stress any easier. No, no, not at all. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, I think that's, a, uh, that's the problem with having 50 states. You know, you're just going to have a – different standard for every state. And that, that's part of the beast that we have to understand. Um, and, you know, whether you're in the fire service or police service or not, you know, that's just the way it is. In some cities, unions are a lot stronger and there's no fitness test that will ever get you kicked out of the police force. Right. You know, it's just not going to happen. Um, but so that's what, you know, we, there are certain variables like like the unions, good, bad, or whatever your opinion is. We we, we have a hard time. Even Stu and I, but let's say let's say we as a firefighter, you may have a hard time. You can't control. That is my point. But what we can control is our state of readiness. Yeah. So I think that's the big umbrella we're looking at. Is like, you know, all of these shortfalls. Uh, we can't always control them all at once. But if we can start managing them. And I think that what Stu and the whole reason why Stu and I do this is because we're trying to give you guys a point of education so that way you can, you know, you can stand your ground and eloquently, just like this firefighter has done, say, hey, here's the here's here's the issues as I see them that we can we can change. And hey, by the way, here's the solution. Yes. Yeah. Present the solution. Yeah, we all see the problem. Yep. And I think the military saw the problem many years ago. We were getting people kicked out and uh, mainly just from injuries, you know, medically, medically retired early and things like that. And, you know, they actually figured it out um, in several different, definitely in the special ops world, you know, where the op tempo was so high and people were getting banged up and they were constantly injured. But, um, yes, you know, they, they figured it out. Definitely. See you a little bit. Okay. See you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, he's, I'm gonna, he, he has his open open house today, so I'm going to go meet up with him in a bit. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, yeah, you know, but we, we figured it out and the, saw the problem, created a solution. There are now, you know, exercise scientists that are part and coaches that are part of a lot of these uh, commands. And that has been very helpful for making a stronger more fit, more durable, uh, military member. The same would be the, you know, if the military or the law enforcement and firefighters could do the same, or at least have some firefighters who are also trained in tactical strength and conditioning, whether it's through a certification or it's further education, you know, either way, I think that would be a great solution for, for several of these firehouses. Obviously not every firehouse is going to be able to have that opportunity have those type of uh, training programs. But I, I think the more benefits that you actually see from all these uh, special programs and special designs of programs from guys that know what they're doing, yeah. you're, you're going to really, um, you know, the, the solution is there. 
Right. And, I, and so like, that's where the beauty of the TSAC where, so quick history and I'll keep it very short. The TSAC is with the NSCA, the national strength and conditioning association. It's a oh. governing body for all strength coaches, right? Yep. So the TSAC has been created and it's been in the making for a long time to improve tactical strength conditioning for police, fire, military. And this goes all the way back to about 2002. Yeah. Okay. That governing body, I, not so much the NSC, NSC or the NCAA where it's the governing body, but the NSCA from point of education is saying, Hey, let's, let's collect this point of this information, one place to disseminate. And, it, and it's, it's basically the stopcock to make sure that it gets filtered because they're all educated, all practitioners and, uh, and educators. So, what SOCOM has done is use that model and then expanded it. It's not like, hey, this is the only way to do it, but kind of like where the police and fire have their national governing bodies. And that's really a lot that, you know, that's for their tactics, that's for their administrative work. Now, how that the NCAA uses the NSCA as their, right? Hey, we're going to refer to these guys. And I think that that's what the NSCA, the National Strength and Conditioning Association, is trying to, and they've done a very good job of just saying, hey, let's collect a bunch of professionals' information here, and if the fire department and police needs it, and the reason why is this is because, you know, the same issue that's being expressed to me uh, time and time again through these emails, and then there's different. There are departments all over the country that have encountered this issue, created a bit of a solution, and began implementing that solution, and gotten a positive result. So, for my, what I'm saying, it really is that for all the fire departments and police officers out there going, man, like we've, we've ran in this big roadblock, what do we do? Well, if you reach into the NSCA, email them or get through us, that's where we throw that big fish net out and go, hey, what other police department has encountered these issues? And then you just make that direct link because it's very difficult for a police department really in a fire to look at Stu and I and go, yeah, they'll fix everything because huh. we're not firefighters. But at the same time, if you get a fire department or police police department that's very similar in its in its makeup, that has resolved some of these solutions, there you're more apt to follow that road of success. So, very Absolutely. long, very yeah. long thing, I guess. But it, it just don't 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 worry yourself too much because very likely somebody has resolved some of these things. So use use them, use us. We'll make the introduction. Yeah, absolutely. And and those you, you can find all these people at the strength and conditioning, tactical strength and conditioning conferences that yep. are you go to the website, I'll put links to them in the uh, description. And it really does help because here's what happens. If you're a motivated guy, got some education, got a certification, and you go to your fire or police department and say, This is what I want to do, all the people above you who are in charge of the the department are going to say, well, does this have any validity? Yes. Right. Is this, where's the, a, where's the math? Where's the yeah, numbers? Where's yeah. the study? Yep. Is it, does this have any validity to it? And because not only are the numbers important just for money wise and, you know, injury prevention and things like that, but also lawsuits. Yes. Right? And they yep. have to make sure that these are not tests that are discriminating against anybody or, or whatever. So, when you see that other uh, departments or and cities around the United States are doing certain programs and they are getting them all val validated, whether it's through the Cooper's Institute uh, yep. or it's through NSCA or other programs. Um, and here's, here's the thing about the cool thing about the NSCA with the TSAC is that 15 years ago, there were not many, academic scientific studies on military law enforcement and firefighters and yep. their job. They were all on Olympic athletes and power athletes and collegiate athletes that were yeah. like trying bad, to get like, so you're, you're, you're badminton and fencing. And you're like, how does this trans, how does this transfer in the tactical space? Right, exactly. So there are all these studies that you, we were trying to pick and choose and are trying to figure out like, how does this apply to us? And they really didn't. And then finally, it, it has really gone gangbusters with all these academic and scientific studies on, I mean, how do people make it through ranger school? How do people make it through hell week? 
you know, all of those things. And what are some of the best, uh, you know, programs to help prepare for that type of stuff? Now, I will say this. There are some programs out there, you know, like the SEAL program and many other special ops programs and some SWAT team selections out there that it's pure guts. You know, it really comes down to how much you really want it. But, you know, but at the same time, you know, these – the National Strength and Conditioning Pro Program with the Tactical Strength and Conditioning is a great resource for all of you if you are seriously considering about promoting a new level of fitness in your yep. uh, department. Because what's going to happen for many is, you know, the, uh, number one, is it valid? And can you, can, what metrics are we testing? The second piece is they're going to go, well, are you, how are you going to staff it? That's a big, that's always, well, how are we going to staff it and pay for it? Now, I've, I've sat down, and I know Stu has sat down with other departments and started uh, problem-solving the staffing and budgeting issues of it, right? But even better than, better than us is if you go to the Tactical Strength Conditioning National uh, Training Event Conference, which is actually next year it's here in Virginia Beach, is uh, you'll have, like, I, I think this last year was the largest ever. Yeah, and it's you, growing. They're in excess of 6,000 people. And they're almost all tactical practitioners or they are in the same regard, they're, they're police, fire, and active duty military. So you're going to have no better time in the entire, in, in our profession to go, man, we really have these issues. And then you can, ha you can just work right with your own peers from other departments. Uh, and we, we're happy. I mean, Stu and I, between the, he and I and the other people we know at the NSCA, we can introduce you to all those folks in person if you come to Virginia Beach next year. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that it's, it's exciting and this is why is because many reasons, but one is because, you know, there's shortfalls when it comes to pro professional amateur sports about kind of the people that are getting this information or just kind of wishy-washy because they're super talented or they don't really care. You don't find that in the tactical space. Like for the most part, everyone loves what they do and they'll die for it. And because of that makeup of these tactical individuals, like so much good positive information is being shared because it's not like, hey, the Raiders are going to hold their information because they don't want the Chargers to know it. Right. Well, in the tactical space, if Police Department A has resolved it, but Fire Department C hasn't, they're going to work together. They're happy to do it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's why I love those things. Like I said, I, I've been speaking at those things for years as, as Jeff has, and I usually, at least for the two days that I'm there, see 10 other presentations because yep. they're fantastic. And they're some of the smartest people in training that are also there, um, as well as very, very uh, professional and um, uh, smart um folks that are also implementing these things and things. So here's what they've done. They've, they've added the science behind training and the experience of the job and made a conference around it. Yes. And it works really well. Yeah. So. And that's how it really started because there was a bunch of people that were just like, Hey, we need to do better. What do we do? And they just, the, the person that created this will kind of, I'd give credit is name Mark Stevenson. Absolutely. And he, uh, from him and a bunch of other John Hoffman, a bunch of other guys have just created this. And really I'll give, you know, Tyler Christensen and Matt Thompson run it now along with Virginia and all those wonderful people. But it's so exciting because they are doing such a good job. And I can say this, there was a while where the NSCA was just, they were just kind of like a book thumper. Like it was just like, all oh, study, all oh, study, all oh, study. or just like, I can't apply this. That is so not the case right now with the tactical. So they are doing such a great job out there and it's, it's so, super cool to be a part of it. So anyway, just go, I'm yes. telling you, go to, go to it. You guys will all be happy. Yes. So, and we don't work for an SCA by the way. We just, we just are students of it. It's exciting because it's yeah. our profession and they're doing such a good job. Yeah. I uh, will say this too. Um, here, here's another conversation I had this morning. A uh, firefighter comes in, and he just got through working 48 hours, you know, straight pretty much, and probably didn't have a whole lot of sleep with that 48 hours. Um, and so I always wonder why he, he only works out with us on Mondays and Thursdays. Well, he works two days straight in the middle, and, and those are sometimes really 
heavy shifts. And it really depends on how busy you are to what you really should be doing when you get off. You know, some days you just might just need to take a walk, de-stress a little bit and stretch and go to sleep. Yeah. Right. Some yeah, days, for sure. if you, if you've had a few hours of sleep and, or several hours of sleep, you know, if you're lucky on that shift, you know, come in in the morning and hit a hard workout with us. But you know, it, it just, a lot of it depends on really what you have done in the last two days. If you take your last two days and if you slept none, you ate like crap and you know, you're just feeling tired and you're like, you just want to go work out to just, for, for no reason really just to go work out because it's such a habit for you. And that's, I think that's where the type a personality and your email comes in. Yep. We're all, we Push all, hard. we all are guilty of that. We all are pushing guilty of pushing. And I, I would say one of my jobs, especially with guys that are on the spec ops side level preparing for it is pulling the reins back on people and not letting them go into that next level of hurting themselves. Right. Agree. You know, and whether that is just overstressing their body and it's, it's just going to be hard to actually see gains, you know, when you're, when you're in that zone or yeah. they actually overdo some activity. And in fact, I have a guy right now I'm yelling at him because he's about to go run a hundred mile race, <laughs> you know, and he's getting ready for buds. And I was just like, yeah, Hey, it's a great gut check and all, and you're a great runner, but, you know, why are you focusing on something you're really, really good at when, you know, you got log PT and boats on your heads coming up in about six months? Yeah. So. Yeah. We, 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 we reap what we sow, but that, but that's the thing is he, he very well may turn out to be that outlier. Yes. He's a complete we, we stud. He's a complete stud. I just hate to see him get injured because last year I had a guy who didn't listen to me, ran a 50 miler, the JFK 50 miler. And his hip was all jacked up for about four months. You yeah. know, couldn't run anymore. And he got yeah. delayed at Buds. He, he got to go to Buds, and he's making it through Buds now. But And he's fine. But, you know, it, it took took him another six months of being rolled with injuries. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So that sucks. You just, you just never know. I mean, and that's, I mean, definitely the case for, for these guys because as I'm reading this, I'm thinking – in conjunction with the, the gentleman you spoke to this morning, the 48 hours that these guys are on, especially if you're in a, in a fairly metropolitan or a metropolitan area, like these paramedics, they're, they're, they're getting all sorts of calls from like women or men forgetting to take their blood pressure medication. You know, like they show up and they're like at three in the morning, like, did you take your meds? I'm like, no. Oh, and th- like, so, and that's, <laughs> that is stress all of itself of like, we are life-saving service providing life-saving care. And then you just have other people just calling life-saving services or no life-saving, but either way they, they're stressed out. They get, they don't get to sleep. Sure. And, and it's, it's a job that is quite thankless right, for most people. They just I mean, assume some, some, that. Yeah, yeah. Some of those guys can do up to 20 calls in a 24 yeah. hour cycle. It's you crazy. Know? So, but I think that that's, you know, for, for Stu and I, we look at these things and say, hey, we, are, we years ago in Spec War, Naval Special Warfare, experienced many of these same sort of, well, you know, we're overtrained or we're underinformed or undereducated. Something's not right. The injury rate is higher than it should be, even though we're in a combat setting. Um, you know, like the, it, there's always talk about what are the standards of buds, even the standards of the PST. Are they changing? Do they need to be harder? Do they need to be, you know, I, I think that people in positions of leadership feel like there needs to be either perpetual change to validate their position as a leader or don't touch anything because it's what we've always done, which is a really scary thought in its own right. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, we certainly, feel like we could help facilitate some of these answers, but I think probably the best way for us to facilitate some of these solutions for the fire department is, is introduce you all to people that have in the fire department or police department that are encountering these, some of these, and then we can just show you our litmus on our side of like, yeah, you know, the spec war staffing and all that sort of things, because we are in that perpetual grind just at 1911. You know, so the human performance program 
is still in its infancy in, within SOCOM. It's really only since about 2009 when it was officially funded. I know Group 2 out here with Dallas Wood was a little bit earlier, but that's just because of who the Commodore was at the time. Uh, and, and what a great dude. That, but So it's kind of like, and even some of the, you know, the, the fifth and third and fifth and tenth special forces groups were even a year and a half, two years later. Yeah. So, but in that very short period of time, SOCOM has done such a fantastic job staffing, implementing, and seeing a really conclusive improvement in like what we're seeing, what you're reading here is like, like non-contact, non-combat related injuries due to overtraining or whatever. Yeah. The solutions are there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. How do you want to wrap this one up? I would say definitely NSCA, TSAC. Check that out. Um, also, you know, something too, you might be able to find on their website the, uh, the TSAC journal. Yeah, it's the, on there, yeah. Yeah, and check, check that out too because every month there are – great articles that are written and peer reviewed and uh, are talking about these very subjects of how to get around the politics sometimes of, of these fitness programs, as well as, you know, some of the studies that led them to make certain changes. Yeah. And that's the thing too, is I know, especially like in the fire department, there is there, you know, there's a lawsuit that's my eyes pretty widely known within the police department from Colorado Springs and, and like, Oh, do fit, you know, testing. Okay. Like uh, we won't need to get into that. But the thing is, is that that is why the, the point is we, we can, we can tackle that sort of very serious argument, legal argument, if you will. I say we, I mean the, our population because of the resources that are actually available to you all. So that, and I think that's the biggest thing is, there's a lot of people that feel probably like, you know, where do I start? The NSCA, that's where you start with information or through Stu and I. And then, well, what's the next step? Well, the next step is we got to do a needs analysis. But the reality is, is that it's already been done. Yes. It's just sharing information at this point. So don't, don't get disheartened because the information is there. People have resolved any problem probably you've encountered um, from big to small police, federal, fire, whatever it is, uh, the solutions have been made and people have, are now reaping. And even internationally, there's a guy named Mick Sterley who just, I don't want to misquote it, but he implemented this in Australia. It's just in the, in, the, in the city of Sydney and he's somewhere saving $380 million a year in non-lost wages now with very simple, doable, under like minimal staff. Wow. He's doing, I think it was $380 million he saved last year Damn. for, for the, for just the, the Sydney. That, that is awesome. Um, and th that's the type of guy you're going to see at the TSAC and yes. he'll give you the information. He's, he, I know he personally has gone to, he's spoken in Maryland, I believe. Yep. yep. He's spoken in uh, the LA SWAT and the LAPD. He's done it for California fire. I believe he's spoken at, um, he's spoken at the, uh, was it NTOA? No. Oh, yeah, national training. officers. Top, yeah, officers that's in Nashville yep. or Louisville. Yep. Yep. He's gone around and going, hey, guys, he, here's my numbers, and they're legitimate. So the point is, is there's answers, guys, and men and yep. women. There's answers out there, so we'll help you find them. Yeah, absolutely. Check those out. Check those links out down here. Um, and, you know, feel free to ask us. You know, and if we don't know the question, we'll – or no, don't know the answer to your question, we will definitely link you to people who do. For sure. And um, who have been there, done that, especially in the police and fire department um, world. So with uh, – without I think step, step three, we're going to go to – within the police and fire units, Step uh, our session three is going to be let's take a look at a little deeper into some of the, the selective police and yeah. fire. So canine, SWAT, Riverine, EOD – Forgive me if I'm leaving a bunch out, which I'm yeah. certainly am. But yeah. some of those where, when there's an when that selection and assessment test really is like, here's our standard, pass it or don't. Yeah, especially if it comes with diving, because there's always swimming involved. You know, there's some skill sets that yeah. uh, if you're a rescue diver or 
mean, there's so many different great rescue um, methods Tons. that are so out there. Really, we're at regionally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Regionally, it might be mountain rescue. It might yeah. be water rescue, you know, you, you name it. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about how do you, you know, cause you're already active. Well, now you have to physically prepare for that selection course while you're still super stressed out. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about. Yeah. I would say this, my, my final piece of advice is this first you get smarter, right? You, you figure out what you need to do, you know, take a TSAC certification, do a little bit of education, study some of that, uh, information that's out there and become a better athlete yourself. That will bring another guy into your circle and another guy into your circle. Next thing you know, your whole department shift is working out with you and it is evolving. It will slowly evolve into uh, a department wide program. And that's how a lot of the guys actually get attention. Yeah, is assimilation. Just that, yeah. And, and they, uh, they just set the example and people want to be like them. And it, it will happen. So, and then keep running your stuff up the flagpole. You know, just just be that uh, squeaky wheel that uh, seeks attention. Um, you know, up the chain of command because you want to make the chain of command better. For sure, that's it. So, absolutely. There you go. I wish you luck, and thank you for what you guys do, police sure. and fire. All you guys, I, I really appreciate, especially you guys down in Texas that are kicking butt down there with uh, all the storms. So, all right. Thanks, Jeff. Yep. We'll see you soon. We'll see you.